get by Benning. Darnell Nurse left it in the corner, gets up center. Perry scoops. Corey Perry. Well, you able to shake away from Solani. It's given away to Solani. Around in front. Score! Tamu Solani with the steal. Three of the fans won one. Score! Off the floor! On the board! Paul Perea! Hey everybody, we're back. Thanks for tuning into the live Twitch stream here, or maybe listening to us tomorrow on uh, America Day, as Canada just had theirs <laughs> on Monday. Tomorrow's America Day, and it's all three of us again, Pat, Jason, and um, Eddie Potter, as he is in his little closet that uh, his parents oh. threw him in, because he's not allowed to. <laughs> say, say Eddie Potter? Eddie Potter. Yeah, he's uh. Eddie Potter. I I'm still in the He's 1990s Hogwarts. horror movie. It's been coined as a 1990s horror movie room, so that's what. Uh, oh, God. That's what we'll keep it. Well, it's so creepy. That's where I reside now. That's this <laughs> is. Well, I don't know. This is now my semi-permanent backdrop for the podcast. Hopefully, by post-game time, it's, it's something a little bit better. Uh, but for the for the summer, this is what you get. So, however however many shows we have left for the summer, this is what you're gonna see. At least, oh, 15, uh, at least fifteen, at least fifteen, at least fifteen more times in the in the horror room. It's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just don't want to see any children running out like immediately. Like, also, where are you going? <laughs> Get back! Here. I think I think the last show we did the light flickered in the background and that set a couple people <laughs> off. So. Like, what? What is happening? So, all right, all right. I got to call the Mountie. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, call all the Mounties in. <laughs> call the Mounties in. Well, boys, do how did where do you want to start with this? Because a lot of weird stuffs happened. Um, since July 1st with the Ducks. Um, and biggest and weirdest being uh, Daryl Sutter is somehow part of the Ducks organization again. Um, again? Ducks did, yeah. Or he's, yeah, okay. He's, he's, he's so never Kelly has again. been, but now okay. he's here. In Seoul, Kelly. Again. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> saving me on that one. Um, where do you guys want to start? Because there's a lot to unpack with the Ducks and the lack of their of free agency moves. Or we could just uh, start with Bitter Beer Face. Whatever you guys want to do. <laughs> Well, this is going to be a happy podcast, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Where everyone's all happy. Why, let's, why don't we start up with uh, free agency? Yeah. yeah. Let's, build <laughs> let's up. save the goodies for the <laughs> we, end. We, we need to build <laughs> up to the Dale <laughs> Sutter stuff. Stupid little longer. Stupid little longer. That's fine. All right. Uh, well, I mean, the what was the, the, the first news um, was back before free agency. Uh, the, the qualifying offer period, which for the Ducks wasn't anything anything spectacular they just didn't send qualifying offers to dodge and trevor murphy and keaton thompson so they became ufas i believe murphy went to the khl dodge and ended up signing with the blues and uh, i have no idea where keaton thompson went uh, but they did qualify chase de leo and uh Kloos, who they got for uh, auberg from the minnesota wild nothing spectacular again it's not like we have uh mitch marner or patrick line or sebastian Otto <laughs> where it's uh, a qualifying offer is something Something fun to watch out for. I mean, kind of as expected, right? I mean, maybe Dodson would have came back, but uh, I'm not surprised to see him go. Yeah. I'm not. Th- I'm not. I'm not unhappy. He's not around. I mean, that's. I don't really think that there's room on the team for him. Really. I mean, they they said they're taking that total turn of let's let all the young guys play and make use of our younger players. I mean, then that's the direction we need to go. I think that's a better move is to let him walk. Yeah, I mean, at, at this point, they're just the only. The only real concern is that they have, uh, and we see this through the free agency, is just restocking San Diego. So, you know, if they, they feel that there's some guys that are a little bit older who aren't really ever going to crack the a, uh, NHL lineup and maybe don't quite contribute enough to the uh, AHL team, why not try and, uh, you know, stock them full of uh, the younger players? Hey, well, it's not like he's extra old, though, right? I mean, he's 25. So it's not like oh, he's work, dead. But, he's old. I yeah. mean, he's, he's one foot <laughs> but, in the grave. I mean, but he did come from the from Tampa. Uh, <laughs> basically, he didn't make their team because he was out of shape. And then he yeah. came to Anaheim, and they signed him. So I don't know. I don't. Know, maybe just not what the Ducks are looking for here, and that's fine. He was. I don't think he was ever going to be more than a five six anyway. But um, yeah, it's I mean, just... why not bring a guy up like Josh Mahara? I'd rather see him in the lineup than Jake Doctor, and be honest with you. Uh, I agree. The only thing that's weird is um, because he's a right shot defenseman, so you lose a right shot defenseman there. Not like he was anything spectacular. Suster goes to the KHL. That experiment didn't work out, but then you lose another right shot defenseman. Obviously, Montour gets traded for Gooley, which is a left shot for a right shot. 
Uh, you lose Walensky. I mean, we're going to get to that later, but you lose uh, Andy Walensky as a, a Group 6 UFA to the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, and the only additions you bring on the right side are Holzer, and then today they announced that Yanni Hakanpa H- was uh, brought in from Karpa in Finland. That's the only reason I could have justified bringing Jake Dodson back um, is is having a little bit more depth on the right side. You just sign you just sign him to a cheap deal, one year deal if that was possible, like the Blues did a one year seven hundred k deal, and uh, he jumps between San Diego and. Uh, between the Ducks and you have another right shot option. I didn't love him. Uh, I'd rather honestly see Holzer <laughs> and, and Hakanpa H- come up and, and give another shot, but uh, they they need help. They need help on defense right now. They don't have a lot of guys in, in San Diego that can come up and, and play, and they don't really have much depth on the right side at all. So it wouldn't have been awful to bring him back unless they have some other guys coming in. No, I mean, but Hakanpa's a big kid. He's 6'5", 218, and he's also a right shot. So maybe just they wanted to go that direction rather than Jake Dodson for whatever reason. But like I said, I mean, we're, we're talking about bottom tier defensemen here. So, I mean, it's not that much of a, of a needle mover. It's not like we're talking about uh, about a BXA on the third pair that we're worried about. Dude, so, I mean, that, that would have just made us so much better. <laughs> he was there at Dev Camp. Was, I heard he was there at Dev Camp. But uh, <laughs> this, this time he was at Dev Camp, I guess, as a coach, not as a player. He's not He's not on a PTO or anything uh, yet. Uh, yeah. well, is, is Stoner still available, or is he a left-handed shot? Oh, oh I saw something there. about him. He's coaching somewhere now. He's not, hunting. He's, he's bear he's hunting. Oh, he's, he's, like, he's coaching bears how to duck. Yeah. I don't know. He's coaching <laughs> somewhere. I saw it. Um, Okay, other news, uh, Ducks signed the Ducks extended Sam Carey. He got one year, 700K, uh, a nice small pay bump for him for being uh, one of the better players in San Diego. And mm-hmm. another depth option, I guess. I mean, the Ducks have a ton of forwards that could start the, the year with them. I think it's like 16 right now, depending on, on who you want to throw on that list. So anywhere from 14 to 16 forwards, uh, he's not one of them. But if there's injuries, which normally with the Ducks there are, a decent option to come up, and he can play center. He can play on the right wing, so not a bad signing. And I guess you know more so this is for San Diego, but I, I don't hate it. I mean, if I had to pick one of the guys to come back out of the guys they've lost so far, it probably would have been Sam Carrick. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean he was he was a high point getter too in San Diego, right? And plus he's part of the leadership group there, so it makes sense that he's back. He had sixty points last year, so I mean, they, like you said, you can't just empty everybody in San Diego and then not have anything left in in the AHL after that successful run they had. Yeah, and especially with everyone that they drafted, the young kids. I mean, most of those guys are going on to college careers or whatever. So it, you gotta you gotta keep the the minor league team happy, but you also have to let you know your your uh, you know your uh, prospects start to get a little bit more uh, playing time in case you actually need to bring them up. So. Oh, Ricky got it. Stoner's Stoner's coaching the Vegas Junior Knights 12, uh, 12 under AAA. <laughs> that's, oh, that's, oh uh, is he really? Yeah, that, I knew he was coaching. So I saw. I think I saw it on his Instagram or his Twitter, and uh, yeah, so he's moving on up. He's he's uh, one day <laughs> one day coach of the Anaheim Ducks after he uh, gets all his stars in in uh, AAA. As long, yeah, as long as Bobby's uh, still the the GM there, uh, everyone who used to be at the Ducks at some point will get a chance at uh, management positions. Very true. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on to the next news. Uh, this okay, this was the weird one. This this I mean, there was a lot of weird stuff. Dale Sutter news was weird too. Uh, but the Ducks acquiring Nicholas Delorier for the Montreal Canadiens for a twenty twenty fourth round pick. It, it, listen, it's not a barn burner. It's not it, it's not a Subban. Uh, it's, sorry, it's not a um, Subban for Weber. It's not a Larson for Hall type deal. But it's it's a bit weird when you know we talk about the log jam up front with guys like Comtois and Lindstrom and Jones and Steele and Terry and and you know Sherwood even guys that are ready to break into the roster at least get a chance. Uh, you bring in a guy who's likely pegged as a as a thirteen you know a twelve or thirteenth forward to come in, and and he doesn't do anything. You know he had five points last year, and uh, played I think forty two games. And uh, he's not great on offense, obviously. He's a big guy in the sense that he's 227 pounds. He's only 6'1", so he's not massive. He's, you know, he's not a, a guy who's going to tower over you. Uh, and he's okay at defense, which you would expect from a guy who used to play defense. I believe he was drafted by the Kings as a defenseman. Uh, even strength defense is okay. It's not excellent. But it's just weird. It, it, it makes no sense. Like if you, you know, it, It's no question the Ducks need defensive help. I just don't think Nick Delore was the type of help you could have got, especially when there's probably better guys in free agency. Nick Cousins is a guy I, I've, I've talked about a lot that you could have brought in, 
or just not gone that round, just gone with the kids. Like, now he's blocking a roster spot, presumably, because I doubt you're going to send him down to San Diego. You can, but it, it would be weird to bring him in and then throw him down to San Diego. Uh, is he a right-handed shot? Nope, he's a left-handed shot. All right, well, there goes my theory of maybe moving him back to defense. <laughs> no, good no he's, he's, played, he's played left wing, I think, pretty much his entire For forever, career. yeah. yeah. It, so, it's... <laughs> I, yeah, so before Pat has his aneurysm, let me just get this out real quick. Yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me either that you would trade a fourth-round pick, which could potentially become an asset that you could either you know mold or hopefully get a steal somehow in the fourth round and someone that could actually make the team and be impactful for a fourth line guy who's just going to be big kind of there as a bruiser unless you're maybe trying to move richie out because if richie goes we don't really have a big forward other than getzloff who's gonna really kind of you know stand up for teammates so that's about the only reason i could see having them is if you're going to get rid of richie as your plan if you don't that guy, that fourth line winger, you can find in free agency all over the place. You don't have to get rid of a fourth round draft pick to get that guy. So it doesn't make a lot of sense unless other pieces are trying to fall into place throughout free agency. But it doesn't make a lot of sense at this point. Yeah, I mean, Buffalo got Jimmy VC for a third round pick in 2021 from the Rangers. That's a that's a far and away a bigger upgrade. What, what did what did Colin Miller go for? Can you guys refresh my memory? Was it a second and a fourth second and fifth? a fifth, or I think it was or second and the a Vegas. fifth. Yeah, in 2021, 2022, two different. I don't picks, think Ve- I don't think Vegas was going to trade us Colin I Miller mean, for second and a fifth. Maybe. I mean, yeah. really, like Nick Deloria. What is he going to do for this team? I mean, they, they, we have so many other players you could you could throw in here. Like you said, why are we throwing away a pick? Um, you know, for a guy that you could fill that role with just about anybody in free agency or from the minors, I I just don't I just don't get it. Um, it feels weird like, to get heated about it though, right? Like it's yeah, not it's it not a it's not a trade that's going to no. hurt the Ducks in the future. Like again, like I heard the argument, it um, could. it's a fourth round pick, and the Ducks <laughs> have never hit on fourth round picks. You can't really use that argument in it. Like it's still an asset that you gave up in, in a draft that's supposed to be really really good next year. Um, again, it's a fourth round pick. It's not like it's a third or a second. No, no, the it's problem, like I'm, I'm not going to lose my mind here on it. But when there's better options available, yeah, and, and like, the problem is like, those, like Nick, Bobby, just, Nick, just stop, just stop yeah. doing what you're doing. Just, uh, just sign, sign somebody, and then use that fourth round pick if you want to make you know like sweeten a trade down the road. Like, oh hey, you know what? Uh, we'll try this. Guy. Well, we really need a draft pick. All right, we'll give you a fourth. All right, now we're talking. Why don't they do that future considerations thing that nobody knows they ever exists? And it's like a, a penny in a hand. Like, like, he's like a <laughs> fifth like, or a sixth. I wouldn't be too upset. I mean, I, I feel I'm not dumb upset. getting upset it's just over like, a fourth. What we, why well, it? it's he kind of talk- I bet you he doesn't even play. I bet you he plays with That's the goals. That's what I mean. Like if, he, just- if, he, if he plays with the goals... And, and contributes, then it's not too bad. But what I see it is, is like he's just going to be an expendable player probably 30 or 40 games into the season. There are going to be guys who either outplay him in San Diego and earn a call-up, and he just isn't playing well, and they get a, a spot over him, or he just plays himself off the team. That's the way I see it going, and if that's the case, then you've wasted a fourth-round pick on a guy who is, uh, I, I believe he's still a restricted free agent at the end of this year, but he's out of contract at the end of this year. The other... The other thing you can think about is GM scratching each other's backs. So, like, Montreal was trying to shed contract and uh, shed uh, salary. Uh, they even made an offer, you know, to, to offer Sheet Ajo. And so, I mean, they easily could have just tried to say, hey, listen, we got to try and shave, like, uh, close to a million dollars off if we can. Try and do what we can to bolster our team. Hey, Bob Murray give us a fourth round pick it's you know you're not winning in this we're not winning in it but you know you're doing us a solid and we'll scratch it back at a later date so i'm wondering find find another dance partner partner (laughs) get get out get out of bobby that's fine get away from bobby yeah i'm just saying that's that's another possibility montreal was looking to shave some uh, some salary off the ducks could afford to take on a seven hundred thousand dollar i think that's his the salary yeah, it's nothing it's just about that and then after the end of this season they don't have to resign him so it's just they're helping montreal out i i feel that's more likely than anything because i don't think they brought in a fourth line uh bruiser to take up a spot from the youngins when they could have think, just no. kept you think they're helping montreal out you you think uh i mean it's i not think he- they do this a lot 
That, yeah. There's a lot of those little it's the plays. Old boys where, club. Uh, I wouldn't even say I mean, it's an old boys club. It's 950k to Montreal with the cap <laughs> okay, space. So it's about right me. Now. Yeah, so it gets about a million in space. They're just looking to get rid of somebody, and the Ducks aren't on the hook for a really long time. But it's like, all right, I'll do you this solid. I'll take him, and I got to give you something, so I'll give you a fourth because we're bad at guessing fourths around picks. I don't know. That's about the only the only angle I can see where this kind of makes sense, where we aren't privy to uh, or, exactly what's going on. Or they just want to add some gritty grit from Gritterton because that's uh, kind of what they like to have on the team, and people like that. The fans have well, said that too. They just the, want a guy banging the body around in San Diego. Like I said, oh, out of Richie's not gone, making then, if Richie's no. gone, then all of a sudden, I mean, who do we have? What happens if Richie's gone? Well, oh man, still, Richie scores still, more goals than Nick Delorier. Come on, yeah, I know. He's but still what if he's gone? Uh, like Richie's still a thirty, <laughs> a thirty straight. point guy, maybe forty point on high upside, and Nick Deloria is like a five to ten point guy across an entire season. So Nick Richie is exponentially better than Nick Deloria, and, and the people who were, uh, you know, a lot of people were negative about this trade, rightly so, I guess. Like you don't have to get too worked up about it; it's not going to hurt the Ducks. But the people who were supporting it, there was this chart by Mike and McCurdy that was going around. That looked at uh, Nick Delorier's even strength defense, his isolated impact on the ice, and it showed that uh, there were, I believe, it was nine percent less uh, chances while he was on the ice by the opposing team. So he he does, you know, he def- the teams play better defensively when he's on the ice. I don't know if that's a small sample size or not. I'm guessing it is. And then you also have to take into quality of competition at that point because this is a guy playing likely on Montreal's fourth four line. minutes a night. Yeah, he, he's playing, you know, five, six, seven minutes a night on the fourth line. The quality of competition likely isn't that good. He's playing against somebody else's fourth line for most of the time. Uh, but, you know, maybe he does have a positive impact on the defensive side. And if that helps the Ducks' fourth line this year in the sense that they're a little bit defensively better, sure, fine. You know, it's worth a fourth-round pick. If he comes in and contributes and can be a role player this year and makes an impact and doesn't play awful, then it's a fourth-round pick, whatever. I still don't like it, but... I'm not going to get too worked up about it. What about uh, the next bit of news here? Jacob Magna, you know, the captain of the goals, Magma. leaving for Vegas. Oh, that's yeah, that's a tough one because again, we talked about Wilinski leaving, and now Magna leaving. The Ducks were already kind of slim on the blue line, and then the only guy they added was Hakanpa, uh, and that was it. So I feel like there's some more moves to come to add to the blue line. Like, Steven Ruggiero can possibly come up and play with the goals this year. I believe he still has to sign a full contract, either AHL contract or whatever. I think he was on an ATO with San Diego last year, so he might be able to come up. Uh, they have Simon Benoit. They have Josh Mahura, presumably, as well. Uh, Kirby Dan Holzer could be one of those guys that uh, moves down and plays. Uh, Patrick Seeloff is there. And then Hunter Drew was also on an ATO. So whether he's, I don't know if he can go back to junior or not, but he's a guy who could possibly play in San Diego as well. They still only really have like five guys. So there needs to be some movement. I think some guys have to be brought in. Probably what we've, some similar signings to what we've already seen. A lot of AHL guys brought in. Some depth signings that maybe we'll see, you know, another guy or another two guys slotting into San Diego. Swedes. Again, but, so many Swedes. <laughs> but it, it is weird, right? Like why, why let him go? He was a captain of that team, and mm. you know you're still. They're obviously still trying to compete. Compete bringing in Andrew Potjuralski, who was a, a playoff MVP for the the Calder Cup winning Charlotte Checkers. Like you want them to be competitive next year, it obviously looks like, and then you let the captain and you know one of your better defensemen down there go. Uh, maybe that was his choice. I don't know, but it is a little bit weird. Mm. Yeah, and same thing with like you said with Walensky going to Philly, Ben Street to the Devils, and we already talked about Dodge to St. Louis. So the Ducks losing defenseman, um, and then the guy who played majority of his time in San Diego with Ben Street. But uh, yeah, the defenseman they, leaving Anaheim's kind of strange. I find that odd, <sighs> especially with a need defenseman and defenseman coming back. I guess it just means there's going to be more moves to come. Like you said, that's Bobby's going to be bringing a defenseman in here this summer. We need him. So yeah, either we're going to start signing or we're going to start making trades that will bring in because uh, we got to restock San Diego. I mean, we're we're about to pluck out a ton of forwards. We just let a ton <clears throat> of defensemen leave. Uh, San Diego's in trouble if we don't like restock that pretty quick. So. This is kind of what we thought was going to happen come, uh, you know, uh, free agency time. It was, there was no, never going to be a big splash with Bob. Never is. Uh, it's usually really minor, and it's usually a uh, bargain. Uh, and that's that's what he's looking for. 
So, but they got to restock San Diego, and so the rest of the way, you'll see the odd signing here or there, and you're gonna not know who that person is. But eventually, they'll come around. They'll be in the system, and uh, they'll be in San Diego. It, I mean, it almost seems like they they up front they really don't have to because they brought in uh, Blake Pitella, which again we'll kind of break that down a bit more, and Andrew Potyrolski, who are good AHL guys. They were the best forwards presumably on their teams last year in Binghamton and Charlotte. So you bring in two really good AHL players that will likely stay in San Diego. I believe Antoine Miranda is going to make the jump this year as well. So you've got that boost. And there's a chance like Jones could start down there, Comtois could start down there, Lundstrom could start down there as well, Kiefer Sherwood might. Like There's a potential that you have all four of those guys, plus the two guys they brought in, and Anthony Stolarz, who could start in San Diego. The only place they have to shore up down there is maybe a depth signing on defense, defense. like we just talked about. Uh, but you still got... You know, Josh Mahura, who's going to be a big piece of that down there as well. And Simon Benoit, who's really good. And then you've, you've got some other options to move around. So it looks like he's kind of focusing on that. There's really been no moves to help the Ducks in, at all other than Hakanpa, which he might play with the Ducks. You, you don't really know yet. And then obviously Nick Delorier. Do how you do you feel? guys... Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I mean, how do you feel? Because, I mean, this was two seasons ago when Bob Murray said, listen... Uh, you know, after we had our exit, it was just, listen, we got to get younger. We got to get quicker. We're going to head this way. And so he said that we went through a year, he said it again. And now all of a sudden everything's kind of becoming that younger group, the next generation that's going to kind of lead the ducks on. Uh, do you got, are you guys happy that that's the way it's going? And this is kind of the growing pains where we kind of have, deficiencies in certain spots as we try and still remain competitive um or are you guys like what the hell is he doing he's screwing this up I, I like the you know this is my opinion real quick before you guys give yours i like that he said this is how we're gonna go and it's gonna take a couple of years to get there and in two years he's pretty much kind of done that he's gone out with the old guys and kind of gotten into that new feel and that younger speedy quicker uh, more creative type of uh players I mean, yeah, no, I think that's the best way to go. Uh, you have to go through growing pains. You can't retool forever like this in this league. It's a young man's game, so you hope that your team drafts well. Bob uh, and and uh, and Madden have done very, very well at producing players out of San Diego that perform great. Uh, we saw Comtois come up and play well. Uh, you saw Jones come up and play great and then get snake bit. You know, he had so many chances, created <laughs> so many guy. plays. <laughs> and just couldn't bury enough pucks. But I I mean, those two guys stood out really well. I mean, Steele came up and played, you know, a, a hell of a time while he was up here. And those guys are only going to get better. So I have no problem with that. Um, I was kind of happy to see some of these old guys aren't going to be playing this year. I mean, as much as everyone loves Corey Perry, and, and I do too, it was his time to move on. And Kessler, it, you know, if he wouldn't have had that injury, I mean, he'd definitely be more of an effective player than he is. But he's probably not going to be playing. This opens up a lot of room. Uh, for some, you know, fresh faces faces in the lineup. And back what we've been talking about now for weeks, Bob Murray had said it. There's problems with the leadership group, with these young guys coming in and, and ruffling feathers with ice time, I'm sure. And maybe Corey was one of those guys. Maybe Kessler was uh, one of those guys. I mean, who knows? Cogliano was one of those guys. Who knows? We don't know. But clearly there was a change that had to be made. And that's the way you have to it just you have to go through this this pain period. The NHL changes every decade or so. And this is one of those times we just got to get to that new game. And the Ducks are unfortunately, uh, you know, near the bottom of the list to do that. Um, and my opinion, they, they haven't moved as fast as I would like. But uh, maybe the bottom third of the league, I shouldn't say last bottom third of the league and changing over. And I'm, I'm, it's about time. We've been, we've been competitive a really long time. I haven't had many bad seasons under Bob Murray. I, you know, honestly, I like the direction they're going. And again, we kind of ripped on the Nick Delorier signing a bit, and, and <laughs> some people ripped on Anthony Stolarz. But when you look at what they're doing, is they're kind of having protection just in case they want to give these guys more development time. And you, know, you look at maybe some of the contracts coming off the books next year. De uh, Devin Shore and Daniel Sprong are RFA's. Doesn't mean they actually get re resigned for sure. I think you would hope Sprong has a good year and you resign him, and, and maybe you resign Devin Shore. Maybe you don't. That'll 
opens up a roster spot there. Uh, Grant, Sherwood, and Delore are all uh, either restricted or unrestricted free agents. Sherwood, you would hope, come back. But if Grant and Delore don't, that opens up roster spots. Patrick Eves, uh, whether he plays or not this year, he, he'll be an unrestricted free agent at the end of 2020. So there, there are roster spots that open up. And you know, maybe if they want Jones or Lindstrom or Sherwood or Comtois to play more time in San Diego this year to, to hone their skills a bit, then you see them more full-time next year when some more roster spots open up and eventually 2021 when you see, you know, Getzlaff come off the books and I'm, I'm sure he'll come back, but you see some more of these guys, you know, Carter Rowney among others. So I, I like it in the sense that they're offering protection just in case, like, you know, if Jones isn't hundred percent ready, you know, if the struggles he had last year, follow him to, to this year, despite looking like he played well, maybe you send him down to San Diego because you can and play a guy like Nick Deloria. You know, it's not the greatest option. I would love to see Max Jones up with the Ducks for most of the year and play well, but you at least have that cover now that you can go and do that. Yeah, but the weird thing about Anthony Stolarz is that he's on a one-way deal, so the Ducks have to carry him and Miller and Gibson or risk losing Stolarz to uh, to waivers. They'll risk so, that. that was the yeah. only strange thing. They'll, they'll that was the only strange thing about it. That's all. They'll, they'll, they'll risk it mostly because he's played what, like a handful of NHL games. Uh, and when he's healthy, and, his numbers aren't bad, but he's had injuries. So that's that was been the, the pullback. Yeah, and, he's still a young guy. Yeah, but you also got to think that they re signing Miller, and Miller's uh, this close to 40. Uh, and, but in my opinion, Miller is, the, you know, he could be a starter in any other team he's just behind john gibson at this point uh so you know with john gibson i you know my injury concerns are zero uh for him unless a whole bunch of freak things happen which can uh and then miller's the same way so uh stalls were uh having him down in san diego is great if you have to call him up even if he gets somehow picked off through the waivers they can bring in Boyle, and Boyle has done it, and he did it last season. So I think it's kind of like that minimal risk, like, hey, if someone takes him off our hands, okay, we still got this guy who has been able to jump up and play. So, you know, it's 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 a minor signing, and it's uh, one that kind of either helps the AHL or the Ducks if no one picks him off. I hope they don't pick him off. He becomes a, a, the number three for the Ducks. I think he's the out-and-out out number three. Not that Kevin Boyle doesn't deserve a look, but I think Stolarz has a little bit more experience in the NHL. He needs more time. Yeah, but you have that option. now. I don't think Jeff Glass comes back. So now you've got uh, depth, goalie depth chart. You've got Gibson, Eck. Miller, Stolarz, Boyle. You've got Ole Eriksson Ek, who will likely get the goals this year. You've got Angus Redmond. You've got Roman Derny, whether he comes up and plays or, or goes back to, I believe, the USHL he might go to. And then I know Lucas Dostal is going back to Europe, but you have you know him in the depth chart as well. So it gives the Ducks some cover this year. It gives them some options. And more, more than likely... It gives them a little bit of cover next year if Ryan Miller decides not to come back. He's on a one-year deal. You've got Stolarz for two. If Stolarz plays well in either the AHL or in some appearances with the Ducks this year, you now have your new backup for not this season but the season after that where you run Gibson and Stolarz, and you don't have to go out and get somebody, and you're paying him 750 k It's It's the perfect option. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You're not paying him that much. If it does, you've now got a cheap backup option if Miller doesn't decide to come back. And if someone picks up Stallers, we could always go back to Chad Johnson. <laughs> no, 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 no. no well, Can't no one that. else is grabbing him. So, <laughs> uh, who did we so, miss? So we talked Stolars. Uh, we talked. Okay, I guess we really haven't talked the other three guys. We'll go over them quickly. Um, <laughs> We briefly talked about them, but they did sign Andrew Potjurelski, which was an interesting move. It's, it seems like a typical Ducks move. Uh, MVP of the Calder Cup playoffs, as we mentioned, 23 points in 18 playoff games. Had 70 points in 72 games with Charlotte during the regular season. Didn't see any NHL time yet, which is which is interesting because you know you would think in a, in a team that's not super deep up front like the Hurricanes, he would have got a shot, but they wanted to keep him down all year. Will likely start the year in San Diego, but he's only 25. He's an interesting option that you know he uh, might he might be San Di- one of San Diego's better players, and if he plays well, he could he could get a shot to come up over some other guys. Now is he the Chris the younger version of Chris Kelly? In what way? <laughs> what way? Uh, well, in that uh, oh well, yeah, well we got this guy and he was really good on you know that team and now. You know, we got him, and either he's speed or he's. You know, he was really good for uh, that international team. 
um, or the AHL team. And is that is like someone we just got? Like, oh yeah, well he's high profile, so we got him. He's ours. Well, no, he was the MVP of the Cup playoffs last year. He's 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 not I a bad player. Him, but it's not 25. a bad player. He had a big jump. He had a big jump. I think he only had like forty nine points in the same amount of games played the season prior. So it might have been just a usage type thing for him. You know, it, maybe he's a late bloomer. Who knows? But it was a big jump on a good team, very good Charlotte team. Obviously, they won the Calder Cup. It's worth the risk. It's a one year deal. Uh, if it doesn't work out that he doesn't make it through the NHL, then he probably you know becomes a fifty to seventy point player for uh, a decent goals team next year, which isn't bad because that's presumably what you signed him for with the the hope that maybe he can become something more, can become a you know a bottom six player. I I don't hate it. Again, it's a typical bargain Bob type move. No, you it, need these low types risk. Of moves, though. Yeah, low risk with the potential for a higher reward. That that's the type of move that Bob usually goes for. And it's kind of the opposite with Blake, right? Like, uh, how do you say his last name? Pete Pytilla? Is that how you say his Pytilla. name? Pytilla, yeah. I'm gonna... Pytilla, yeah. Nailed so it. similar. Nailed it. Similar. He's a productive <laughs> NHL guy. Played a bunch of time in New Jersey last year out of necessity. Didn't do so well. They get four points last year. So he's going to be the AHL guy uh, most likely back in restocking in San Diego as we, you know, move the kids up and down throughout the season for sure. One assist in 19 games for New Jersey last year. Oh, okay. Uh, four, four, four points over Four's career. 35 uh, career NHL games. Uh, like offensive that, so. juggernaut. He can we, can we like talk about NHL. Corey Perry again now? <laughs> I'm, I'm well, excited. Well, 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 I, I feel like we're there. <laughs> we're almost there. We are, we're almost there. Uh, oh. <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't talked. To, the, the most important signing, presumably, because he's the guy most likely to actually get a spot with the Ducks this year, is Johnny Hakampa uh, out of Finland. Finn. Uh, 850k one year deal almost like proved that you can play in the NHL former St. Louis Blues draft pick now he's 27 uh, but you talked I think it was at the breakfast that Murray said he was looking for a big right shot defenseman um, I think he also okay. said that can power, shoot the puck. power play yeah, yeah, power play, minute eater, yeah, yeah, that yeah, a quarterback. Maybe, power play. yeah, that's maybe the only thing he can't do. But he he did finish second, uh, tied for second in goals in Liga, which is a big jump for him. He had eleven. Uh, you don't really see that too often from twenty three points in fifty two games. Was third on his team in, in points for a defenseman. Uh, but he's six five. He's six five, so he's a big guy, and he's more of a stay at home defensive type defenseman. But he's a, he's an interesting guy because he did have that offensive spurt last year. So. I, I'm I'm a kind of cautiously optimistic to see him play. Like I I, I would like to see him fit in on on the uh, the the bottom pairing on the right side, just because I like to see left right left right as much as I can, and it'd be nice to see him maybe work with a guy like Jakob Larson or Josh Mahura, uh, and and not have to see Kerbinian Holzer in the lineup on a nightly basis as well. So I I hope so. I mean at 27 he's been around. He's been playing against men. He seems to be getting better. I think it's worth a shot to finally get him in the uh, in the NHL. So we'll see. Well, I mean, if he's six five and he's um, presuming two twenty, two thirty, somewhere in that range, um, I mean, is he is he one of these uh, shoosters where he's a gentle giant, where he's just kind of a big dude, but no, he's you know, a, that, he's that a, bigness he doesn't heavy. really matter. He plays heavy, he apparently. Plays From heavy. what I've read about him, he, he he uses his size. I think he's only like two oh nine too. So he's not like, I'll have to double check that. I've been doing a depth chart, so I've been looking Damn. at a lot of guys. Uh, I'm six let's... three, and I'm nowhere near two oh nine. Let's see. Yeah, you're way under. Pat, way under. Pat, Sorry, he's he's two eighteen. <laughs> he's two eighteen, which is still like not <laughs> okay. Well, that makes me feel better. <laughs> for for a six five guy, he's still still he's a little slender. bit leaner. Yeah, slender, he's still a yeah. leaner. But uh, so he's got a nice beard, so. <laughs> Well then, well, then he got the Ed stamp of approval. Hey, so so uh, chat is saying not to talk about Corey Perry. So maybe we got to gloss. We got to just skip over that. No, no cannot. I'm saying no more, no more Corey no, Perry no. talk. Sorry, we got to no. talk. About I'm sorry, that. all the Corey Perry talk we've just not ever done yet. <laughs> yeah, with, it's quick. The last time it's we very talked quick. about it is when it's very it, quick. We know where he went. We know agency. what happened. And it's, we had the it's rumor a painful that he was going to Dallas. And that was it. Um, so if you don't want to listen to this part, it's going to be about five minutes. So, yeah, let's uh, turn it down. Earmuffs. Earmuffs, everyone. Yeah, tune back in after. <laughs> but uh, if, you, if you somehow didn't know, Corey Perry is off to Dallas. One year, $1.5 million base salary. And then up to $1.75 million in bonuses, which uh, Frank Cervelli, unique or 
I guess he, he nicely structured out for us. Uh, he gets 250k <laughs> each time he plays 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 games. He gets another 250k if he makes the playoffs and plays at least 50 games played during the season. So basically 250k for making the playoffs. Gets 100k if he wins three rounds and plays at least half of those playoff games. And then gets the final 150k if he wins the Stanley Cup and it plays at least half of those playoff games. Um, if you round it out, he gets $3.25 million if he hits everything, which is around what we thought he'd get for a one-year deal between three and four. Uh, interesting to see that structure because, you know, they are obviously worried a little bit about the injury problems that, you know, it saves him a bit of money if he does get hurt or can't play and misses most of the season. Yeah, and he's also betting on himself. And that's kind of what I thought was going to happen. Uh, is that uh, you know he was he was pretty much listen I'll I'll take a really minimum base salary and it's it's a weird structure that is like oh yeah it's based on games played which also says a not only am I not injured but I can actually crack this lineup and be productive somewhere where I'm being used um, but uh, at the same time yeah I, th- I thought it'd be a really minimum. Uh, as far as the base, and then just performance after that. So he's betting on himself, which is it's nice. I mean, he's got confidence that his knee is a lot better. He said so uh, in interviews and everything else. So, you know, it it stings. It sucks. It, it kind of blows. Hold on, Pat. It kind of blows just because he, he was so close to 1,000 games. He's been such a part of the Ducks and the community at, at large. Um, and even Pat has semi benefited from Corey Perry in the fact that uh, him and Getzloff are the ones who actually pay for the learn to play program for the kids. And your daughter went through that whole process and that came straight out of uh, him and uh, Getzloff's pocket. It wasn't anything from the docs. It was them putting that money in. So he's done a lot for the community, Chalk Hospital, all that money. other stuff. Money. <laughs> so uh so anyway so it's it's sad to see him go it, it's it's nice that he's still at least in the league it just blows we never i feel like ducks fans and i might be the only one here but it just blows that we never got that g- goodbye it wasn't uh you know hey oh you will well if he's healthy and plays 12 games that 12th game will be against the ducks but that's in Dallas. Game. It's in Dallas. It's not that's here. Fun. We won't see him uh, until the next year, or whatever. And I'm sure we'll have the whole ceremony and whatnot. But I mean, it was just most Ducks fans are a little, I don't want to say upset, but conflicted. Just that we didn't get, we didn't get a chance. We thought that this was a possibility. His last game of the regular season or whatever. You know, we probably would have given him a salute, something like that. So, so it's that's just some incident like for upset. you here. But and my favorite like part of this. Go ahead, Eddie. Sorry, <laughs> I was I was gonna say, my if, favorite part of this whole thing. If he plays the, through the start of the season, the first twelve games of the season, October twenty fourth in Dallas, the Ducks yep. play the Dallas Stars yep. at the American Airlines Center. Uh, it'd be great if it was at Honda Center, but you know, it's it's not too bad. It's still. I, I no one. I'm playing this. <laughs> I just want to shit on yeah. Stars fans real quick. Um, Go ahead. As you do. Their, no, they've had their their <laughs> this line after line after line of having thirty players play on that team, and none okay. of them are anywhere near as successful as Corey Perry. And they're all just not all. I would say about half the Stars fan base I've seen on Twitter. Like I saw a comment on and Eric Stevens retweeted. Um, the jerseys for Pavelski, number 16, Perry, number 10, and Sakara, I think, got five or whatever. And I'm like, one of the comments down was like, oh, man, don't print too many of the number 10s. You're going to be sitting on that inventory for a while. I was like, really? You guys said Ryan oh. Garbett. We did, too, but Garbett wasn't always a clean player. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's Roussel a ba- that's a bad is example. a theater <laughs> through the roof. You want to go back into history? Darian Hatcher, who was a you know just garbage when he just – Go out now. I hate him now. It's just so games many. So what many about players. Brendan Moreau? Uh, give me your feelings on him. Yeah, geez. Just, all just all these people who are like, <laughs> we hate that guy, that type of player, until he plays on your team, and then I give it, give it a, give it a, you know, ten or fifteen games. The Stars have and, plenty of like, those players. Like what about so it, depa- it really depends. If, no, no, he's in Vancouver. Never mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Russell's uh, gone out of there. Uh, but yeah, it depends if Corey Perry does well. If he flounders early or the, for the first ten games or something like that, oh, they will they will just love you, know, just blast him forever. Uh, if he comes out and he starts putting up you know 
four or five goals in the first ten games, yeah, you'll you'll see a, a quick shift in uh, their mentality of how much they hate that pest. I mean, didn't Sean Avery play for this team? Steve Ott played for the team as Lowry. Team, uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Lowry pointed out in our chat, yeah. Steve Ott played for them. So they've, they've had... Yeah. The list goes on and on. Yeah, they've, they've had their fair share. Um, but I guess this that's, is that's America. it. America. Right? What else that's it for Corey. Do? Everyone else can can tune back in. I'm wearing my Corey yeah. Perry jersey, which Pat probably hates, but no, I, am. No. I was gonna wear mine, but he's not on the team anymore, so I didn't. <laughs> I also don't uh, have one. So we had bad. we had some front office stuff, uh, I guess, and some hockey operations stuff, right? Uh, Francis yeah. Oshiman mm-hmm. joins player development to assist Todd Marchand. Nothing really which is weird. It's because cool. that guy moved to Montreal. Yeah, I thought he was working with Montreal. I honestly did. Yeah. He was doing broadcast stuff is what I thought. I, and I only know that a little bit because um, he was part of the Lady Ducks organization here my daughter plays. And his daughter's a few years younger. And they're like, yeah, we're not coming back next year. We're, they moved to, moved to Canada. But I guess now he's and back. They did, uh, so. When the Ducks played Montreal, I think they... Well, they just don't want to hang out with you, Pat. I never Ken met. French, they were going to Ken Montreal for one to full year. All right, he's gone. All right, we're back. <laughs> like Ken French talked to him last year and... Uh, I think when they played Montreal and they were, you know, talking about I think Paul Korea's retirement and he was talking about like his position with the Canadians, I believe it was right now, and what he's doing and then all of a sudden he's back, I guess, which is cool. In a way, he's not gonna I don't think he's gonna do too much. I mean, maybe he'll move up in the organization eventually, but it's gonna help out Todd Marchand for now and it, it's not a bad Very well liked player in Anaheim for sure. So everyone yeah, loves Frankie thing. to come back to the team for sure. In in, in yeah. any capacity, everybody wants him back. But did didn't he he was he Three different tours with the uh, the Ducks, right? Was two or three? three? Maybe, yeah. I, I know it's two for sure. I, maybe it was three. I thought it was maybe three because I thought we had them. Someone in chat, help us! You're smarter than us. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I thought we had them. Lost them to, to Toronto. Uh, Toronto. Brought them back. Brought him back. Then he went to Colorado, and we brought him. Yeah. Back. Okay. Yeah. Then it was. Yeah. It was. Sometimes. Yeah. All I right, forgot. Cool. I forgot he went to Colorado. Then we. <laughs> yep. him, right? Sorry, so. I had to go down a rabbit hole real quick. Yeah. Ducks. Toronto. Ducks. Colorado. Ducks. Ducks. Then yep. Montreal in a capacity, and then back to this. Yeah, just four just times. stay here. Four just times. He's, he's a conflicted <laughs> lover. He just loves this area. And all yeah. Are you guys us. bummed that he's not going to hit a thousand <laughs> games in his ever in his career? He retired. He's at nine oh three. He could have played another. You know, you guys are all sad about Perry. I mean. 87 game or 97 I'm, games. I'm, I'm, I'm games. less upset yeah, about that and more upset about that. I know the difference. Finished at 892 <laughs> goals. He couldn't find, he couldn't, he couldn't play one more season, rack up eight more goals and just make it even 900. That's the OCD in me. Uh, but yeah, no, I don't care that much about Bush. Yeah, no. Not hitting. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's get into the weird. The, I, this has to, you know, weirder than Nick Delore, weirder than anything that's happened. Uh, Daryl Sutter joins the Ducks as an advisor to the coaching staff, way out of left field. Uh, we Did we not mention Daryl Sutter in our coaching carousel that we talked oh, about way boy. back? Did one of you guys mention Daryl I Sutter? Think, I think we put like a top 20 list and he was like 19. Yeah, he was Somewhere in there, just there. like he was he, like, he's a person, he used to coach, and he's actually a possibility out of 20 people. Well, the good thing is he doesn't want to be a head coach anymore because when this originally got announced, people were like, oh, God, is he is he the second option now if Eakin's experiment doesn't work yeah. out and now yeah. he's going to come in? That's overreaction. And then, uh, thank God Lisa Dillman and Eric Stevens put out a, a great article if you haven't checked it out because it has a ton of information on that uh, that hiring, bringing in and, and kind of understanding what the whole process behind that, what kind of role he's going to have with the organization. Uh, he's just a consultant, right? He, he's not going to be behind the bench at all. Uh, he's there for Eakins to lean on, which I think is great, honestly. Like, he, the experience that Daryl Sutter has and obviously the pedigree he has winning cups with the LA Kings, if he doesn't have too much power and it's just, you know, he, you know if Eakins doesn't rely too much on, uh, you know, his play style, which I doubt he will, I think it's great. It's great to have a guy like that to lean on to get an experience from. Uh, Eakins was a guy... Uh, in the article, he made a comment where he said, like, this was the number one guy on my list to have as a consultant for the team. So he obviously was behind it and wanted this, uh, wanted Daryl Sutter to come in. So, I mean, I'm, I'm for it. It's weird. It's out there. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the thing I'm glad about is he's not going to be behind the bench. And he doesn't seem like he's going to have too much power in coaching decisions as much as he's just kind of an asset to lean on if Eakins needs any help. It's odd. 
Yeah, it, fe- it feels like uh, Dal Higgins uh, needs to make a phone call to somebody. You know, I was like, all right, well, I want to talk to Bob because we suck right now, and he's going to yell at me for a while, so uh, I'll call Daryl. Uh, that's what it feels like to me. Um, it, it just It's a little odd because you're talking about a guy who's uh, two years removed from being an NHL coach, and the last few years of him being an NHL coach, he wasn't exactly great. Uh, the only thing is that, you know, he has a wealth of experience through years and years. And so, I mean, he might be able to kind of see things from afar and be able to, you know, advise and go like, hey, listen, I'm not in the, you know, the trenches with you and what you guys are seeing. I can tell you what I can see when I'm watching a game and how I feel that these guys should maybe do things a little bit differently. Here's my opinion. Take it or leave it. That sort of deal. My my biggest hope is that he he gets completely involved in how Dallas Eakins has to respond to media questions because there is nobody better other than maybe Tortorella who can respond in such a comical negative way than Daryl Sutter can. The one answer. The one answer is like, hey, you guys could done better. Yep. It, it, it can't be, like, Dallas Aikens and Daryl Sutter are, are almost complete opposites, is what it feels like when you look at how they deal with the media, how they deal with players. Like, Aikens is a player's coach. I, I don't know Sutter personally, obviously, but he does not seem like a player's coach whatsoever. Nope. And uh, different styles, different systems, different way they view the game. Uh, Aikens is into to analytics and looking at the game analytically. I can I can assume that Daryl Sutter is not, especially the way he ended his career with the LA Kings, not not <laughs> wanting school. to change that defense first old school system that uh, is really the reason the Kings are in the situation they are right now. Well, they play uh, dump and chase. Like that's the weird part, right? Listen, they it, play dump is, and chase. Is uh, as long as that this situation doesn't turn into a Dave Nonis situation where Dave Nonis is no. was brought on as a consultant to Bob Murray and then now as an assistant GM, as long as Daryl Sutter doesn't become an assistant coach and pre- possibly a head coach in the future, which he said he doesn't want to be, I don't care. I'm fine with it. Whatever. He's not going to have that much pull. Aikens is going to. This is going to be his team, <laughs> and it's just it's just an asset to lean on. Like I'm not I'm not too worried about it. Yeah, no, it was a big overreaction by a lot of people, probably myself included in that. I wasn't very happy with it at all. Yes. Um, I would say a slight overreaction because it is still odd. But when it came out that Dallas Eakin said that he wanted it and that that was the one thing he wanted and it's the one thing that he's really looking forward to getting. And you read that article um, on The Athletic that Dillman put out and it's just like, wow, Dallas Eakins really wanted Daryl Sutter. Um, And it goes back even further because Bob Murray and Daryl Sutter played together on the Blackhawks. They've been friends, I guess, for 40 years. So they know each other. It's kind of like rekindled a friendship there. So it goes back to the old everyone knows you, everybody in the league. And um, the communication was there. And and Daryl even said that he's had these kinds of conversations with other teams. But this one just happened to be the perfect fit for him. So um, coming on, and and if if that's what he's going to be to Dallas, which is, is, you know, his, I guess, I don't know, lifeline, if you want to put it, right? Somebody (laughs) could go to for... You know, having you have questions about you know maybe how you handle certain situations, whatever. But um, Sutter's going to be at training camp, is what I understand, and he's going to be considered a coach on the ice when he's on the ice. But like like you said, Eddie, he's not in any sort of capacity of being on the bench and doing those and making those types of decisions. But much more relief when you find out that he's not being brought in as a contingency plan. He's being brought in uh, to basically. They haven't even figured out what his role exactly is, and then, so they termed it. <laughs> and so they're still figuring that out, you know, in the article. So they're yeah. still trying to figure out what they're going to call it. So I was not happy about it at first. I'm still, I don't know how you could put it, um, skeptical, well, it's weird. indifferent, you know, skeptical, because you want to go the young and the young, you know, the young, quick, new age NHL, and and Sutter's from that old school age, and that's just kind of odd. And like you said too, he wasn't really a players' coach. His, you know. Dallas is well, what's kind of also, weird in the worlds. What's also weird, too, is Rich Preston is not coming back as an assistant coach. He's moved into a scouting role, is, yep. what that, uh, is what that article also said. But now the Ducks apparently aren't looking for a third assistant coach. They're just going to run with uh, three that they have with Dallas Aikens. Sorry, the two assistant coaches that they have, and then obviously Dallas Aikens, and then now Daryl Sutter as uh, an advisor to the coaching staff. I hope it's not a supplement to finding a third assistant coach. That's what I. That's what I was a little bit worried about. Is you know, it's now they're not going to go out and get a third guy because they got Dale Sutter. If they yeah, I don't think so because they said a lot of teams do what they're doing. This is like the Ducks are catching up, I guess, because 
uh, apparently yeah. a lot of teams have coaching like I and the Sky guys, right? He's not on the bench. He's not there on the make it. You know, worried about opening the door and and making line combos. He's basically you know up there up top, seeing the game from you know the the yeah, sky box they have. Yeah. yeah, getting that perspective up there and maybe implementing you know some opinions here and there as to you know the way Dallas should be handling things. But I mean. It's much better after that article came out. At first, I was like, oh, oh, oh. Uh, Nick Delorier, Daryl Sutter. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, going old school. Yeah, well, no, it, I, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of the more information you can have from uh, whatever sources you can. You know, where you put your value is important. So, you know, if you put a whole lot of value in Daryl Sutter, eh, and I'm hoping that's not the case. But, you know, you're talking about Dallas Eakins, who also wants to do analytical stuff. He wants to do what he knows from the AHL and the players he has. But he wants to maybe tap in from what, uh, you know, previous coaches and their successes. Just to take that information in and then you rely on the head coach to take all of that information and make it work on the ice. Make it his own way. Not lean too much onto what one person says versus what another person says. So the more information, the more input you get from other sources that are maybe a little bit removed from the situation, I don't see that as a negative. I just The only way I can see it as a negative is if one person has way too much effect on what that coach is trying to do. But I don't think Dallas Eakins is that type of person. He just wants input from everybody, and then he'll just... You know, yeah, he said it was the one thing put, he wished he had when he was in Edmonton. Figure out what first he wants to deal with it. Yeah, he wished yeah. he had it when he was a rookie coach. Uh, and yeah, he didn't have. Operation in our chat brings up a good point. Kind of sums up what Jason said. He, he says, "I think when you have a consultant, you need someone with a different viewpoint than yours to challenge you." I, I, that, well, like we said, if Aikens and Sutter are close, as close as to opposites as you can get. Why not bring in a guy that has a different viewpoint to lean on? You know, if you want a, a different look at something that you're trying to deal with, you want somebody else's opinion. Why not have a guy who views the situation completely different to you do? And and uh, Gwen Bombay says player coaches can get walked over. And maybe Sutter is there to prevent that. I don't think he's going to have that much power and that much pull. But in that type of situation, he can kind of you know, Akins can learn from what Sutter has to say about that type of situation. So I, I kind of get it in that sense where you've got a complete opposite, a different viewpoint, and and that's probably the best guy to help Akins at this point. I would I would assume I, w- I would look at it that way. Hey, the fact that he wants him to be that guy is, is that's the perfect spot for him. Then let, let Akins yeah. get what he needs to be comfortable behind the bench in Anaheim and be successful. So yeah, definitely not as upset for sure. <laughs> Looking forward to the start of the season. I'm just gonna I shake. Oh, we're gonna have a huge rant on this. Nah, I, I mean, I was all nah. prepared to go guns blazing <laughs> if that article didn't come out. I was like, "What are we doing uh, here?" The most uh, secretive operation in Anaheim, like they always are. They never tell anybody what's going on, and then they actually. I'm so let us glad <laughs> that that article came out, so we don't look like idiots getting so heated over this situation. You yeah. guys were really got heated. I thought this from the beginning. I'm like, all right, well, he's just he's just a consultant, and like but I said, he was just like, like can't, oh, you know, I, you gotta be worried after what we saw all year from from Randy Carlisle and the fact that like may may maybe but I feel like like Bob Murray learned his lesson the fact that he had to he had to put his ass behind the bench because he made a bad decision with his coaching and stuck with it too long I don't think he was going to make that same mistake again and so I just can't see that he would bring in Daryl Sutter as oh here's your backup yeah you know he start doing it right that sort of deal. I just I never saw that as a possibility. It was just once he got hired, odd for sure. But you know, and then you start looking at what Daryl said. I mean, his family is all hockey. It's just hockey from brothers to what he's grown up with to where he is now in his life. I mean, it's just that's a wealth of knowledge you can draw on, and uh, especially you want when you put the word consultant in there. It just doesn't scream. Oh, assistant coach. Oh, guy who's you know, player development. It's just, it, it seems removed. Let's hope so. Hope okay. it stays that way. Well, the <laughs> last the last thing we have to get to then. Uh, Garrett on Twitter asked us the question, and uh, we kind of briefly touched on this a bit in, in other shows, but we can do it a little bit more now that we know some guys aren't coming back and some new guys in the lineup. But he wanted us to talk about what the lineup will look like to start the season because. From what you look at, there's about 16 forwards who could or should be in the NHL, and we still really have no idea who's going to fill out maybe even like f- f- four to seven on the D positions for the Ducks. Uh, when you when you look up front, like there's some obvious guys who are going to be there. Raquel, Getzlaff, Kasha, Silverberg, Henrique, 
Troy Terry, you would assume, Daniel Sprong, Sam Steele, Shore, and then you've got Richie, Grant Rowney, Nick Delory, who they just brought in, Patrick Eves if he's healthy, and then a bunch of kids in Comtois, Jones, Lindstrom, and Sherwood. That right there is 17, 18 guys if Eves is healthy and you've got 12 roster spots, probably 13 forwards on the team. What, 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 like, what do they do at this point? Like, who, who do you, who do you start? Like, who do, who do you send down? I mean, there's some obvious answers with guys on their ELC and being waiver exempt, but that's all the kids right there. Like, yeah. it, it's. A, I, I don't think we see Lundstrom in uh, a Ducks uniform very often. I think you're going to see more Jones and Comtois and Sherwood, if anything. And I, and I would lean more towards Comtois being given the chance to ferment in the AHL and give maybe. E- but I can also say that about Jones, because even though he came up and he looked in place, the production didn't quite hit. But he was so close so many times to being just a, a prolific goal scorer for us uh, that I'd be interested to see him even get a shot in there. Uh, you know, it, it kind of comes down to who's who's able to move up and down. And with the Ducks injury history, even though I know they're trying to address that, um, you look at Kasha, who every season seems to have a concussion somewhere in there, and that's a winger. And, I mean, you have him up there, and you maybe have one of the, the younger guys playing the AHL to begin with, and if there's an injury, it's easy to bring up those players than dropping a Delorier down there or you know someone else who has a one-way contract, you know, starting them in the AHL and then trying to bring them up and having them pass through waivers. So I think you maybe see a few more of those players that come to us, the Jones that maybe start in the AHL, and then if injuries kind of kick up, then they're they're easily upgraded into an uh, NHL role. Like who who do you take out though? That's that's the thing. Like we have to say like Raquel gets left, uh, Kasha, Silverberg, Henrik are probably Bert. locks for the top six, right? Like those are locks. Richie. Today. Richie's probably going to play. Uh, not, not in the top six, but just he's in. Yeah, Richie's going to play. Devin Shore is probably going to play. Uh, Daniel Sprong, that's an iffy one. Uh, Carter Rowney and, and Derek Grant, you would assume, would play, right? Like, you would assume that they'd be in the lineup. Then it comes down to, is Sprong going to play? Are they going to scratch him? Are they going to send him to San Diego? Uh, is Steele going to be the guy up? Is, is Troy Terry? Like, I would assume Terry and Steele are the most likely guys, the way they played in the NHL, to get a spot next year. And then Nick Delory, like, you're going to start him in San Diego? Or are you going to play him as a 13th forward? Are you going to play Grant or Rowney? Is the, like, to me, all signs point to Jones, Lindstrom, and Comtois are, are going to be in San Diego unless they, they play very well or play their way onto the team and somebody plays their way off. Uh, the interesting one for me is Kiefer Sherwood because I think he has a spot on the Ducks, but when you look at the right side specifically – and you've got guys like Kasha and Terry and Rowney. For me, it comes down to Sherwood versus Sprong. Whoever they want in the lineup at that point, whether it's goal scoring or a good two-way guy, I think they're going to decide at that point. But other than that, like I, I just can't see Jones you, or come to our Lindstrom from making their way into the team unless they outplay somebody. Do you think Sprong could outplay um, Rowney and then also Sherwood? and have Rowney in the minors. Because I, I like the way Sherwood plays, especially as a fourth-line guy. And Sprong, although, yeah, they gave him a, a whole lot of grief, it seemed like, uh, during Randy Carlisle's uh, stint, uh, as far as uh, you know, uh, uh, healthy scratches. I feel they got him at a bargain still for another year. He's an offensive guy, and they're looking for young offensive guys, and he could probably do that better, in my opinion, than Rowney. Uh, he, def- he definitely can. I just... I don't know what you guys think. I, I just don't see uh, Bob Murray or uh, even Dallas Aikens just having Carter Rowney not in the lineup or, or in San Diego. I don't think they, they want to risk losing this guy. I think they like what they brought. I liked what he brought as as a fourth-line energy guy last year. Um, you know, Samuel Whitman well, in the chat. Place says, Sherwood. Yeah, but like, do, he says, do we really think Grant is better than Jones or Terry or Comtois? No, but... <clears throat> We've seen the Ducks utilize uh, guys who can get sent down who are waiver exempt in the past. Shea Theodore, Brandon Montour, you know, we've seen them do it. And when you look at the fact that Kiefer Sherwood and Lindstrom and Jones and Comtois are all waiver exempt and uh, in that same breath, Sam Steele and Troy Terry, even though I think they're going to make the team, are also waiver exempt. 
then maybe we see a guy like Delorier or Patrick Eves, if he's healthy, uh, you would assume he'd be on the roster, or Grant or Rowney, who aren't waiver-exempt. That's when I see them making the team over, over Comtois, who's had eight games of NHL experience, although he played really well. Maybe they start him in San Diego. Same goes for Lundestrom. Jones and Sherwood, I think, are harder options to predict because they both played significant time last year and looked pretty good. But then you're saying, you know, yes, Jones and Sherwood are better than Grant and Rowney, but they're also waiver exempt, and you can send them down to San Diego. Uh, yeah, I say they start in San Diego, and then if an injury pops up, then they jump in. And depending on how they jump in with those injuries and how they produce, that's where you'll see if they stick up there. But more than likely, they're going to play it safe because they can easily keep those guys down, wait for an injury to happen, which unfortunately is inevitable in NHL season. For every NHL team, someone's going to go down. Someone's going to have to jump up. It's much easier if a guy who can't drop down without going through waivers gets injured. Someone who can jump up without getting picked off can jump up in their position. And that left wing side is just jammed. It's jammed. The wings are jammed. Uh, the, the Ducks have just a lot of players that can slot in. And uh, as long as they have Devin Shore, I don't think we're going to see both Jones and Comtois up and play unless they want to mix the roster around and mix lineups up, which we'll see how that goes with Dallas Eakins. But, um, yeah, I, I don't really see those guys starting unless they outplay the hell out of somebody in training camp. They're gonna, those guys are all going to, the, to San Diego to start the year for sure, like Jason said. Yeah. The lineup that you have right here, Ed, Raquel, Getzloff, Kasha, Silverberg, Henrik, Terry, Shore, Steele, Sprong, Richie, Grant, Rowney. I think that's your starting lineup come uh, October. Yeah, and, and for sure. I, think, I think they debate. It between, will change. Yeah, I, I think they debate between having Sherwood on that lineup and then I think Delorier becomes, you know, a 13th forward. But I, I would put money down now that I honestly believe that for sure come to uh, and Lindstrom are going to start end up Start in San Diego, you know, maybe they, they play a couple games at the beginning of the season, but I'm going to assume that they will play the beginning of the season in San Diego. Jones, I, I would think, would start there as well because I just can't see him getting in over Raquel, Silverberg, Shore, and Richie just because he is the only one out of the, the those four that are waiver-exempt. Um, again, for me, it's Sher- Sherwood's the, the iffy one, but he is waiver-exempt over Sprong, so again, I just see... I just see them them sending him down, and you know it sucks because I want to see these guys play with the Ducks, but it also it also makes let sense. them get better. <laughs> it, it, it makes sense. It makes sense to put them down to San Diego if they're waiver exempt and not risk losing depth if guys do get picked up on waivers, and then you have to deal with injury problems later in the season. Yeah, asset management, right? You got to wait a little bit, and, and yeah, I mean, what you... laying the bed you made, and that's what they got going on right now. Yeah, I mean, what are you going to do? Put Jones on the fourth line and try and see if he prospers there? I mean, it just, it, you know, as, yeah, as good year. as he is, it's like give give him first-line minutes in AHL. Just get that going. Get it, you know, get that whole vibe going that I can do this. I, I'm, I'm better, I'm way better than this league. I can make that next jump. Put him on the fourth line and have him play seven minutes a game, you know, even though he could dominate seven minutes of the game. Wait till he's good enough and things move around to where he's getting 14 minutes a game or he's getting close to 20 minutes a game. You know, just let that percolate for a while. Well, we have to move on to defense. Uh, I, on that subject, I don't think the Ducks mm-hmm. add anybody else in free agency because of, of the logjam we're already talking about. I mean, we were surprised they added Nick Delorier to this mix because that throws a, a wrench into things some more. Uh, but when you look at the blue line, there's less of a question mark there's more of a question mark on who's actually going to play there rather than you know trying to fit guys into the roster because you have a a clear top four you would think obviously Lindholm and Manson will likely play together Uh, maybe they'll experiment with Gooley and Fowler Uh, Larson I would think makes the team Uh, but then you have you know really a a three-man race for that bottom three that bottom sorry that bottom third pairing six six <laughs> where you've got holzer uh hakanpa who's just brought in and then maybe outside chance to josh mahura to make the team i i would again we talked about waiver exempt guys he probably starts in san diego uh but I, I i still give him an outside shot to maybe impress and play there but when you think that he's the left hand guy out of two right hand guys vying for that spot to be the second right hand guy in the lineup just can't see them running with five lefties so it, for me it comes down to Holzer oh, and Hakanpa for that last spot and they probably both make the team and one guy operates as a seventh man 
But uh, it'll be interesting to see who actually vies for that spot and if Bob Murray actually goes out and gets somebody else and adds to that mix. Yeah, so that'll all change, right, in a couple months when Bobby <laughs> brings in some players. <laughs> but yeah, as, like it stands right now, as it stands right now, you got Lindholm, Manson, Gooley, Fowler. I think that's your top four uh, for sure because we all know that the oblique injury from Gooley is is, uh, is healed up and he was moving around without any sort of restriction either in death camp. So we're definitely going to see him uh, come training camp. So that's your top four. Larson played fine minutes, right? And not a, not a, not a bad deal for him being a third pair defenseman. And then they got Corbinian and Holzer. So, and those guys don't play extra meaningful minutes in these games anymore. So they're going to lean on their top four like the rest of the NHL. So, yeah, I mean, I would be I would be curious to see who Bobby brings in. Uh, he got that big fin, so we'll see if he gets some play time here. So, but as it stands, though, I mean, I think that's the lineup until we get to see more changes um, come this summer. Really. And I'm 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 not too down on it. I mean, how are you guys in the Pacific Division? I feel like we still got the Sharks, the Vegas Knights that we got to deal with. Kings, I'm not as concerned about. Um, and then whatever the the Ducks can do. I mean, that that's what. Other than that, it's Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, uh, Vancouver, Arizona, Arizona. 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 It's it's a, again, it's an interesting. They're mix. a bubble team again. <laughs> it's an interesting mix in, in the Pacific where, like, some teams, you, they could be good. Arizona could be good. Edmonton, you never know, right? You never know what they Calgary could do. Calgary could still be good, but they got rid of Mike Smith, and now they bring in Cam Talbot. Cam that was Talbot, a yeah. weird goalie switch. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, no, I mean, no one Jose, really wins in it. <laughs> San Jose could be good, but they lost Joe Pavelski. Uh, still trying to get Joe like, Thornton. Yeah, still they're trying fine. to get Patrick. Yeah. Martin, but you know, they should be still good. But again, Martin yeah. Jones was horrible last year. Maybe that comes back to bite them. It's it's a big question mark, I think, for almost yeah. for pretty much every team in, in the Pacific Division on, on you know how good they're actually going to be. Uh, yeah. But the, it, I don't know. Maybe Bob Murray brings in a Ben Lovejoy. Maybe he brings in an Adam McQuaid. Maybe he goes after Ben Sherratt, which a lot of people have been saying in our chat. Like they're uh, Sherratt. Okay, I, I can see that. Maybe you know they're still UFAs. They're not signed right now. Maybe he's looking to bring that in. I think if if he does, that's the one spot he addresses. I think Eric Stevens put out an article where he looked at guys like Colin Miller and Travis Hamanick as his potential trade options. Both yep. play for Pacific Division teams, which. I think the Ducks easily could have gotten that Colin Miller deal worked out, but I'm sure Vegas was hesitant to send him to a team that they're going to be competing against, especially when yeah. you look at a, a second and a fifth. I'm sure that's something Bob Murray would have loved to give up for a, a right-shot defenseman. Uh, I think he's 27, who's locked down to a very good deal at $3.8 million. That's a that's a Bob Murray deal if I've ever heard of one, but I'm sure Vegas didn't want to give that up. So maybe you know, maybe he can find something. I don't hate it going in with this. I, I Like I said, I'm cautiously optimistic about Hakanpa if he can come in and actually be a, a, a six or a five and play well uh but the ducks the ducks have s- some holes and specifically that big hole in the number six slot on whether you know holzer's gonna play 82 games or hakan is gonna play you know they're gonna split and play half and half or josh maher is gonna fight for a roster spot because we have no jacob magnet we have no andy belinsky to rely on and bring up in the lineup it's gonna be weird until they figure out what they're gonna do this summer but i mean it's not the sexiest lineup it gets a bit sexier when you bring uh, you know, our, our young superstars back up to the team. So that's what I'm waiting for. So I, I wonder if Bobby's done with making any sort of shuffling or if he's going to shuffle a few more deck chairs and bring in uh, some, some guys to fill in you know, the bottom half of this lineup. We could see a trade up front because of how many guys yeah. are, are up there. You know, maybe uh, a Nick Ritchie or a Daniel Sprong or a Devin Shore. Or a Shore Devin Shore. Adam I could see a Shore or a Sprong guy or a Sprong get traded for sure. I, I don't think Adam Henrique, but his name has been in, the, in trade rumors since the trade deadline. Well, mostly because you tough keep one saying to give up. it. Yeah, it's mostly you, Ed. It's yeah. mostly <laughs> he's on. <laughs> listen, he's on TSN's trade bait board, which means uh, very true. Uh, very true. Uh, but, is that a uh, Canadian trade bait turn? <laughs> there, there's a there's a chance. I, I, I if they oh, yeah. make a move, I it's either bringing in a right shot defenseman. If they do, they're likely sending an, a forward out to to make room up front for some of the younger guys, or just to clear up some of that roster space. Uh, honestly, I wouldn't move Nick Ritchie to allow a space for for Nicholas no. Delorier because <laughs> I, I still That's like the only reason he would. Yeah, I like I, the I fourth st- line: Ritchie, Grant, Rowney. Perfectly okay I, with I that. I still one. like Nick Ritchie as a, as a depth piece. Uh, I, I do like Devin Shore, but if you have to move him out, then you know I guess I'm okay with that because he is an RFA next year, and I'm not sure if the Ducks are actually going to bring him back. And, and as much as I'd like to see Daniel Sprong play, uh, if you really want Comtois or you really want Sherwood or you really want Max Jones in the lineup and you have to get rid of Daniel Sprong to do that, 
Maybe you got to do it. They healthy scratched him. And I know that was Randy Carlo, and maybe that changes with Dallas Aikens, and I'm sure he'll want to get a good look at him. But it didn't seem like the organization was too happy with his play in his own zone. We'll see if that, you know, trans transfers over with the new head coach behind the bench. But that could be a guy just because of that that gets moved out. Very true. Hey, so what's this giveaway we got going on, man? Yeah, so uh, Puckpedia. They we reached cool. out to them for something else, and then uh, you know Hart, who is the guy who runs Parkpedia over there, uh, said that he had some Anaheim Ducks gear that he was looking to give away, and he wanted uh, to give it away it? through us. Uh, nope, you can't because it's going oh. to the listeners. But uh, he has some cool stuff Damn. that he, he's going to give away through our show. Uh, the first one is a team signed stick from the 2013 uh, 20th anniversary team, which is really cool. And oh, then nice. we have that's uh, awesome. We have a puck that is, uh, depending on which one we pick, it's either signed by Corey Perry or Ryan Getzlaff. So you can mm. you know, get a nice mm. piece of this, a nostalgia in the Corey Perry puck, or you could get uh, a Getzlaff puck, which is which is still a nice consolation prize. I don't even think it's a consolation. I think that's uh, I think that's a winner. As long as Stefan Robida signed that stick. That's uh, uh, that was, that was the player I was waiting. Oh, oh I yeah. Stanislaw Stisa or uh, uh, Stanislaw. Let's uh, for anybody who doesn't remember, let's go. Or Bobby Dallas. <laughs> let's go through that 2013 team. And, yeah, not 2003, uh, oh. Jason. Oh. Oh, yeah, I was way off, sorry. Was the Brian 20th Allen? anniversary team the 2013-14? <laughs> was that the 2013-14 roster, or was that the 2012-2013 uh, yeah. roster? Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, you said the giveaway's uh, the 2013 team, right? Uh, 20th anniversary uh, team. What was the 20th anniversary? Jesus. God, now we have Is German Titov still on that team? This seems like uh, stuff <laughs> we should have researched before the show. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're, we're never ones to be uh, good at whatever we do. All right, Anaheim Ducks, tw- <laughs> 20th anniversary. Uh, Can I start guessing? Terry only two seasons. Oh, you're just trying to guess who's on there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's 2013-2014, uh, guys. Yeah, 2013-2014. Okay, so uh, we is, have... Is, is, this, is it just me? That seems like a very forgettable season. Uh, yeah, because Ryan Getzlaff had 87 points, Corey Perry had 82, and the next highest well, there, Benino, there. Benino with 49. So we have... Eddie McDonald. Getzlaff, McDonald. Perry, Benino, Matthew Perot, Andrew Cogliano, Cam Fowler, Dustin Penner, uh, Kyle Palmieri, <laughs> Pancakes. Daniel Winnick, yes. Pat Maroon, Saku Koivu's on there, Timo Selene, and I, I don't, I'm assuming all these guys <gasps> are on there, but don't... Uh, 2013-2014, man. Yeah, that's that's the team. Uh, Matt Valesky, the whole, whole team. Sammy Votnin, and Ben Lovejoy, Boschman's on there. Uh, possibly Emerson Edom and Dante Smith Pelly, but they only played a handful of games. Brian Allen could be on there. Yeah. Lucas, Lucas <laughs> Spiza, <laughs> Stefan Robita, Mark Fistrich could be on there. Raquel played 18 Jesus. games. I don't know if he's on there. Uh, Jonas Hiller and Freddie Anderson could be on there. Uh, oh, John, Hiller. John Gibson played three games, so probably not. Uh, and Nolan Yonkman, like you said, he played two games. So Yonk. <laughs> Maybe, no. uh, maybe he's. And that there. wasn't really a forgettable season, really. I mean, that, the Ducks were fifty-four, twenty, and eight. First, the Pacific, first in the West. Wow. That was not a bad year in Anaheim on the regular how season. Do we, how do we do in the playoffs? Well, that's the year we lost to the Kings in Game Seven. In, wow. Uh, round. Wow. So, yeah, that not, was a forgettable not the season. greatest. Scott, Scott Niedermeyer <laughs> listed as an assistant coach that year, by the way, as well. Ah, oh, his first year not playing. Fun. All right. Well, that's yeah, a, hey, that, man. That's, that's a hell of a uh, stick. That's what that's what we're giving I'll away. Take that puck. Um, and the way you can enter is tomorrow we will be posting on social media uh, a post that you'll I don't know you'll see it sometime in in you know midday afternoon. Just keep checking back. We'll pin it on our Twitter. So if you think you missed it, just head over to our, our Twitter page at Forever Mighty FM and check it out. We'll run it for a few days so that if you don't get a chance to enter it, you we can keep retweeting it and, and reposting it. You can come back to that tweet uh, and find it. So. We'll uh, we'll post it. I believe it'll most likely be on Twitter. I'm guessing. I'm gonna talk to Hart tonight and tomorrow and see if they want to do it up. I think we're just gonna do Twitter. So sorry if you don't have Twitter. Uh, make a Twitter account <laughs> real quick. I, I, if you have one yeah, follower, you have Dave. zero followers. I don't care. Just you can enter it if, as long as you have a Twitter account. I think that's what we're gonna do. So uh, make sure if you're not following us to follow us on Twitter and make sure you, you check for that post and. Uh, We'll be giving away the stick and the puck tomorrow, then. That's awesome, man. I'm glad that they were able to do that. So, so thanks to Puckpedia for that's that awesome. giveaway. Um, yeah, so that's it for the show tonight. I, we are going to be doing a Patreon show this weekend. I'll catch you guys up on the first week of free agency news. 
So if you're a Patreon member, that that show will be coming to you. Um, if you're not, I'm sure we'll find something to do here once the Ducks make some motions. Uh, or the just become a Patreon here. member. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, do that. But you can do we that have, too. Uh, we have interviews coming so up. So many good shows. Uh, yeah. We have an interview with uh, a Ducks prospect from this draft uh, coming up. And then we're scheduling one with another uh, Ducks prospect from this draft coming up, hopefully, as well. We had to wait till Dev Camp was over to schedule, obviously, because some of them were, or all of them were, in uh, in Anaheim and not in their hometown. So. One of them is is confirmed, waiting to be scheduled. The other one is is in the process of getting set up. So look for those in the next week or two coming up, and we'll we'll have those out there. And check out our Instagram because we revamped it. Uh, we have a bunch of new posts uh, that are exclusive to Instagram each day. Just you know, if you, if you've been on there, you've seen them. Different video posts, different quotes. We were going through different articles, pulling out the best quotes for the ducks. So. Just a way for us to, to create more content and put it on Instagram. So that's uh, at Forever Mighty Pod on Instagram. So make sure you guys go check that out. Yeah, man. Thanks so much for you guys for listening, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Bye, guys.